Hello and welcome. I'm Glenn Torres Fellis, your professor, and this is the International Issues Lecture Series. Thanks for joining me. Our topic this week is going to be climate change. Now, there is little question that throughout history we've seen climate fluctuations. They occur naturally and regularly, but the question that confronts us today is somewhat different, and that is, is mankind having an effect? Now, the most recent evidence, according to the United Nations, NASA, NOAA, and every other significant scientific body, is yes. It is extremely likely, that's the language they use, that man has been involved in changing the climate. Now, the effects of climate change could have lasting repercussions with respect to food production, health and public safety, diversity of species, and so on. So we're going to need some sort of human ingenuity to cope with the challenges that we're facing. And the international community has been doing that through the development of international environmental laws and policies. So let's begin our discussion by talking a little bit about the history and development of international environmental law. By 1972, the UN General Assembly had held its first global environmental conference, called the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, in Stockholm, Sweden. Over the next 20 years, states developed a number of environmental agreements across a number of sectors. The topic of climate change was first addressed in 1992, with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. It was produced at the Environmental Conference in Rio de Janeiro, and under that framework, states agreed to stabilize concentrations of greenhouse gases. But the state parties recognized that stabilization wasn't enough. So they have held yearly meetings trying to agree to some type of overall framework to not only stabilize, but also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The first attempt to do this came in December of 1997 in Kyoto, Japan. A protocol to the UNFCCC was adopted, accepting that developed states should be bound to certain targets and timetables that could reduce overall emissions by up to 5%. This was known as the Kyoto Protocol, and it used some market-based approaches to encourage compliance, such as emissions-based trading. Now importantly, Kyoto did not involve any commitments to reduce climate-changing emissions by developing states. It was only commitments by developed states. This was problematic for the United States, who disagreed with the classification of China and India as developing, despite their status as significant polluters. In 2001, in Morocco, the US announced it was not going to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, based upon its belief that, one, the emission targets were not scientifically based or proven to be effective. But more importantly, as time has gone on, was that developing countries were not bound in any way to contribute to reduction efforts. As the yearly meetings continued, this question about the role of developing countries became more and more significant. Whether at the 2011 conference in Durban, or the 2012 conference in Doha, or whether at the Warhouse Warsaw conference in 2013, the US consistently maintained that a new approach was needed that methods had to be adopted that would encourage not just the developed world's participation, but the participation of all major players in the international economy, including China and India. Which leads us to the 2015 Paris Agreement. For the first time, all nations decided that they would take steps to curb emissions of greenhouse gases. The way the agreement is intended to work is that each nation is to submit what is called a Nationally Determined Contribution, an NDC, to the UNFCCC. That Nationally Determined Contribution is the state's own assessment of how much it can reduce its emissions. Importantly, this does leave some room for differences between developed and developing nations. But the key fact for proponents of the agreement is that all nations now have committed to reduce their emissions from their own countries. The problem, critics of the agreement would suggest, is that these nationally defined contributions are voluntary. There are no legally binding requirements for nations to actually meet their emissions goals. Here's an analysis from PBS, 
discussing the benefits and drawbacks of the treaty. Joining me now for further analysis of the Climate Change Summit Accord is Michael Levy. He is a senior fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations here in New York. So but really the big question is, what does this mean for the United States? For the United States, this means that we are done with 20 years of fighting over the basic architecture of an international agreement. And if we flesh this out right, we'll have a framework where we can have more insight into what other countries are doing, a regular process for pressing them to do more, uh, and some greater certainty about the international structure that we're working with. These are big compromises that are made between a lot of different countries. What did the United States want that it did not get? I think the United States would have liked essentially no distinction in the agreement between developed and developing countries. This has been the fight for years. Uh, it would have liked exactly the same language about obligations for developed and developing countries on transparency, on updating their commitments, on what those commitments would look like, the basic elements of a deal. Uh, they got a lot of those distinctions removed, but there are still bits and pieces of that in the agreement. And that's a sign that we'll still continue to fight about those uh, over the next year and in the years to come. Yeah, you were in However, in November of 2016, Donald Trump was elected president. And part of his platform had been a promise to get out of the Paris Agreement. And in June 2017, he made good on that promise. I am fighting every day for the great people of this country. Therefore, in order to fulfill my solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. The president's decision, while popular among supporters at home, drew the ire of world leaders. But begin negotiations to re-enter either the Paris Accord or in really entirely new transaction on terms that are fair to the United States, its businesses, its workers, its people, its taxpayers. So we're getting out, but we will start to negotiate and we will see if we can make a deal that's fair. And if we can, that's great. And if we can't, that's fine. As president, I can put no other consideration before the well-being of American citizens. The Paris Climate Accord is simply the latest example of Washington entering into an agreement that disadvantages the United States to the exclusive benefit of other countries, leaving American workers, who I love, and taxpayers to absorb the cost in terms of lost jobs, lower wages, shuttered factories, and vastly diminished economic production. Thus, as of today, the United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord and the draconian financial and economic burdens the agreement imposes on our country. Importantly, President Trump's announcement had little immediate legal effect because the treaty itself, under Article 28, provides that withdrawals are not to be permitted until three years from the date on which the agreement was entered into force. That was in November 2017. So the first time that a state would be able to begin to withdraw was 2019. And then, as you can see in Clause 2, it says that any such withdrawal shall take effect upon the expiry of one year from the date of the notification. So again, if the earliest you can submit your notification is November 2019, which the Trump administration did, making the U.S. withdrawal November 4th, 2020, the day after the presidential election. And indeed, the Trump administration sought to give effect to its withdrawal, but it was short-lived. As President Biden was inaugurated in January 2021, he signed an executive order reversing that decision. And in February of 2021, the U.S. formally rejoined the agreement. So technically, the U.S. was out of the Paris Agreement for only a couple of months. Now, importantly, the Paris Agreement is not without its flaws, including that unless countries begin to set much more aggressive NDCs, we will come nowhere close to meeting the goals of limiting global warming. 
The question that we will focus on in our studies this week is whether President Biden was right to rejoin the Paris Agreement, or whether President Trump was right to withdraw. Okay, that does it for this week's short introductory podcast. Go on to read the lecture book and the readings for this week, and I will see you on the discussion boards.